Good afternoon. I now call to order the April 21st meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's budget committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Slade if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Slade, would you please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee? Ms. Hen? Present. Ms. Pasteur? Present. Ms. Jose? Ms. Mack? Present. Mr. McMillian? Present. Thank you, Ms. Slade. Um, would you please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Dr. Scriven? Present. Mr. Saris? Present. And Mr. Tantliff? Present. Are there any additional staff participating that were not mentioned? Please state your name. I believe that's it, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Ms. Slade. And I'd also like to welcome board member, Mr. Kuhn, to the meeting as well. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Our first item on the agenda is the County Executive's Fiscal Year 2022 budget. I present Mr. Witt Tantliff to provide a report of the County Executive's budget. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Um, there were uh, two documents we distributed um, for the board meeting today. One was a summary uh, spreadsheet that showed the differences for the county exec versus the board proposed and also a word summary. Um, either if ever, everyone has that or Ms. Hen, would you like us to put the spreadsheet on the screen? Yes, please. Jim, can I uh, do that with the setup now, or do you need to do it? Uh, Mr. Tantle, if you can go ahead and just share your screen, and I'll put it live, okay? Yes. Um, this is, I, you all have a PDF. The only difference is, uh, a few of the items that the county executive indicated he he would not be able to fund, but should be funded with federal um, revenue are um, on the sheet you have are highlighted. So I'll just mention them, but I, I'm using the spreadsheet here because it's uh, larger and easier, I think, for everyone to see. Let me make it a little bigger. So I'm just going to uh, run through the changes and then entertain any questions committee members may have. Uh, so first of all, the CE's proposal is 40.1 million or 4.7% above maintenance of effort. Local funding for the general fund budgets 28.2 million or 3.3% above FY 2021. And then versus the board proposed budget, he removed the per pupil funding increase of 3.3 million and the school-based family engagement grants, which were 175,000, 
he removed the corresponding board mandated budget reductions to fund the items above, which were three and a half million. He removed the 35.6 positions, which included uh, 18 counselors, five social workers, 10 health assistants, two float nurses, and 0.6 nurse for the ESOL bus, which is 1.7 million. But in the CDE's message, he indicated there was possible funding for 35 new positions, including counselors and PPWs using anticipated federal grants. Um, and when he mentions anticipated federal grants, he is generally talking about the CARES II grant, which we'll talk about um, after this, the application of which is due next week, and the 217 million American Rescue Plan grant, sometimes called CARES III. We haven't received the application for that yet, but when he uh, indicates that, uh, the, that is a federal revenue he's referring to. Uh, the board had proposed a July 1st 2% call out. The CE provided a July, I mean, we the board provided July 1st. The CE provided a half year 2% call out, which was a $9.1 million savings. He left the reductions of 122.3 enrollment based teachers, uh, which the board had left. But in his budget message, he indicated these positions could be added back using anticipated federal funds. Uh, 250 teachers to reduce class size were removed. That was 13.5 million. Uh, the board had added 15 minutes to the school day. That was removed at 27.6 million. Uh, but again, on this item, the CE's budget message noted the extra 15 minutes can be funded using anticipated federal funds. He increased, increased BCPS's um, other post-employment benefits, often called OPEB, and that's basically our fund to pay for retiree medical benefits. Uh, you know, if anyone's not familiar with it, it's almost like a pension fund, but for medical. Um, he increased the contribution there by 7.2 million to 28 million total. There was a fringe benefit reduction just because of all the change in positions of almost 13 million. He adjusted salary turnover to save $3.4 million. Um, he added a full year principal and a half year admin as well as 1.05 million in one time startup costs for the new Northeast Elementary School, which now has a September 2022 opening. So um, a few months ago that moved up by a year. So the year prior to opening, we include startup funds in the budget. Uh, he funded reclassifying the system's 24 athletic directors to 12, 12 month employees, which was 141,000. And then the final item, which wasn't in the general fund, but um, it was a board uh, mandated initiative he removed funding for the expansion of the community eligibility program. However, in his budget message, he noted the CEP program expansion could be funded using federal grants. That's a summary of uh, the county executive changes that he released on April 15th. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Tantleff. I have one quick question, um, a general question, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to committee members um, for their questions. For those items that are not funded through the county executive or the county appropriation, do we know what the process will be for determining the use of federal funds for those items? And how is that reflected in our final working or in the adopted budget rather? Sure. Um, the federal funds are grants, just like any other grant managed by BCPS, similar to Title I. Um, the IDA passed through grant for special ed and a, a variety of smaller grants that we have, um, similar to the CARES I grant, which as uh, you all know, um, we've been spending since the pandemic hit. So uh, the county executive does not have any direct control over those federal funds. Of course, he can uh, talk to the superintendent um, and try to influence how they're spent. And hopefully there's a good, healthy back and forth and the board can get pulled into it. Um, but in the end, it's managed like any other grant through uh, BCPS. And in the adopted budget, uh, we did add 
potential just dollar placeholders and special revenue, which I'm not showing here, um, but just approximate dollar amounts that we'd have that you'll see in the adopted budget um, under under um, the American Rescue Plan primarily. We used about a third of that, 217 million, but again, that's the largest one and we haven't even received the application for that. We anticipate that will be due sometime in the summer. Thank you. Um, based on that information, and I appreciate, I think the board would appreciate having the opportunity to participate in the determination of how those federal funds are used, um, given that we approved a budget that includes items that were not funded through the county appropriation. Um, I would like to ask for a motion that the committee recommend to the full board um, asking the superintendent to prioritize items in the approved budget that were not funded by the county to prioritize those items um, when considering the use of federal funds. Do I have a motion? So moved, Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Is there a second? Second, Mac. Thank you, Ms. Mac. Ms. Slade, would you please um, call a roll call vote? Ms. Pasture? Uh, yes. Ms. Jose? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Slade, and that motion carries. Um, I now will call on each committee member for questions concerning the report. And thank you, Mr. Tantla, for, for presenting that. That was a very helpful overview. Ms. Pesker. Okay, um, thank you. Um, as we look at each of these lines and going, uh, considering the motion that um, we just made and we passed, what as far as you know now, will be our guidelines and stipulations in terms of dates, lines, um, what we can or cannot um, include out of the federal funds. Do you have that information yet? Um, is, I'm, I'm not completely clear on your uh, question, okay. but what I would say is the CARES 2 grant uh, is due on Monday, which we're going to talk about after this. And then the new grant from uh, the latest stimulus or COVID relief package that passed recently, we've not received an application for that yet, but we anticipate it will probably be due sometime this summer. Okay. And um, that's a piece of what I was asking, but are there any stipulations like in one you know there was a date like march one there was a date um when we could start wait a minute i'm not asking as well there was a date when things arose that we could use for which we could use that money uh, you mean like retroactively uh, yes sure. exactly um uh, I believe the CARES 2 grant um, is covering retroactively several months, but I don't have the exact date in front of me, but we're not uh, planning to put any items from fiscal 21 into the budget. The uh, proposal that we'll be putting forth will cover FY22 and FY23. So that all dates and whatever in terms of the things that were cut that we would want to consider, and I'm thinking again per that motion, should be germane and, and fine and be a natural fit into CARES 2, right? Well, three. well, three. well CARES 2 were pretty locked because uh, three. there was a tremendous I'm amount of work from staff to put the application together. So uh -huh. I think the American Rescue Plan Act um, has, you know, that application hasn't been put together yet because we haven't received it yet. Right. right, right, right. 
and and hopefully it'll make you feel better. The CARES 2 does cover several of the items that were, were cut. The proposed. Okay, the that's where I'm going. I want to feel better. Okay. Let's get that right. That'll be the next agenda item. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Pester. Do you have any other questions? Oh, you're on mute. I think I do, but someone else can go just for the sake of time since it's quarter after. I'll come back to mine. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Joes? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tancliffe, for the presentation. Uh, this spreadsheet, has this been sent to the board? Um, uh, I do not believe that one has been sent to the uh, board yet in the weekly update. Can you go back to the screen if you don't mind? Sure. Thanks. Uh, can you explain the line item seven where we have device cost reductions? Sure. That was planned reductions in the cost of our device contracts this year. We didn't have a new, uh, or next year, this is for next year. We don't have a new grade rolling out next year. So if you recall, elementary schools last year got Chromebooks. This year we had savings from middle school doing Chromebooks. Um, staff use the full-fledged devices as do high schools. These costs were just fall offs in our regular device schedule costs. So in other words, the number of devices we're buying versus uh, the cost that we had in the base this year. Um, so we had renegotiated a couple years ago all of the device contracts. So these were planned savings in the overall device program. Um, high schools will be addressed in FY23. That will be um, after the four years of their device leases um, come to pass. So is this a one to one device ratio for all elementary school children because this board had reduced the, that uh, ratio to a five to one for K through third grade and with the pandemic, I believe you the system had to mail out 30,000 devices to maintain the one to one device ratio. Does that include that or are you using the CARES Act to uh, negate some of that extra funding? Uh, yes, the, well, there's two things. This is unrelated to that. This is our regular device contact contract primarily for staff because next year no new grades are planned on getting the devices. So think of it as status quo for K through 12 um, one to one devices. We did use, and you'll see that when we look at the CARES um, summary in the next agenda item, we did spend quite a bit of money on devices using CARES funds. Okay, and can you scroll down the spreadsheet? Is there? Um... Sure. Thanks. Uh, and this is an attachment if you wanted to look at it at, on your device more closely. Okay, and can you also um, clarify the CEP that you said was reduced? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so you can see right here, uh, the board voted to expand going into FY21, the CEP to 87 schools. That was, um, you know, what you can call an unfunded, unfunded mandate because it would take approximately $2.6 million from the food service fund to pay for that. So in other words, they would have been uh, burning down reserves to cover that. Now, very little of that cost, real, well, none of that cost has happened so far this year because all the students were remote and the way we're paying for food now is really a completely different program. Although again, we'll, we'll look at this in the CARES grant on the next item, food service has, has been burning through um, a lot of the reserves this year. But in any case, we had requested 2.6 million from the county executive to fill in that hole so that food service wouldn't uh, need to fund it. And obviously there's only so much they can fund if their expenses are more than their revenue. The CE did not fund that, but he recommended that we use 
um, the CARES grant to pay for that. So that would cover at least the first two years of the, the next two years of the program. And do you at the top of the head know what is the revenue loss for food um, services in terms of expanding that program? Well, it's about 2.6 million. Two, this 2643 is how much they would lose per year on the program expansion. 2.64 million. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Tancliff. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, as a quick follow up, Mr. Tantliff, is that because the reimbursement is not equivalent to the cash paid for, for meals? Well, uh, you're not getting any students who are paying, so you're losing uh, all of that money. And uh, just the way the reimbursements work and uh, the amount of children that will be eating. Uh, but I think it's primarily the revenue loss for from no one having to pay for their meals. So are you saying that the re the federal reimbursement doesn't cover our food costs? And overhead costs? Correct. OK, thank you, Ms. Mack. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Tantliff. I just wanted to um, back to Ms. Hen's motion. Just wanted to clarify that we're talking about four things on the PDS, is that correct? It's the 35 positions, the um, the 122.3 um, enrollment based teachers, the 15 minute school day and CEP. Am I missing anything? Well, those those are the four items that the CE did not fund that he recommended should be or, or yeah, I guess let's just use recommended be funded using federal funds. There are other things he cut. Right. You know, no, no, I understand. But those yeah, are the those. four things that actually get to the heart of Miss Hen's motion. Is that correct? Miss um, Hen would need to clarify if those are the only four items she was referring to. I was referring to those things that were cut that we included that were cut. But so there were other items that were cut that the CE did not address. Prime, like the, for instance, the per pupil funding increase. That was probably the most significant one that he cut and didn't address. So okay. we good. I'm that's sorry. Why, Thank that's you. why I was asking um, the question about stipulations because there were several things and my understanding would be that we would take a look as a board probably and a committee and board to process which things either fit or don't fit or which things we saw in terms of a line of priority. Yeah, that was at the center of my question where Ms. Mack just went. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Mr. Tantliff, is that a um, report that you could easily provide the board with a list just of those items? that were not funded so that we can consider take it to the full board. Um, if you look at the spreadsheet that we that we're looking at right now, which you all received, if you um, see right here, this is the CE's budget. This is the board budget. These are all the things he changed. So anything negative is a reduction in what you proposed. Now some just happened because they're fringe benefits and they're automatically tied to the people. But if you go through each line item, it's it's like very, very crystal clear on what was changed and how. And there'd probably be no better summary I could uh, provide. And then the Word document that also went out with the meeting, which I went through, really just lists all of these items that are on the spreadsheet. OK, thank you. Uh, Ms. Hen, I have a follow up question to that. Go ahead, Ms. Matt. So Mr. Tantliff, what is the time frame? And maybe we're going to talk about that when we talk about the funding. But what is the time frame when we as a board would know whether or not these things ultimately get funded? Um, the council votes um, on Let the budget at the end of May. 
Well, uh, I'm talking about the optional, the, the, oh, okay. the things that we just talked about. Well, I guess I, I would say two things. The CARES 2 applications due Monday, so that's pretty locked what's going to go into there. Um, and so once it's submitted, uh, what I'm going to show you is preliminary, so it's a little different than the final. Um, so that will be submitted and, you know, there's always amendments that happen later on, but that, you know, for argument's sake, will be locked. But the larger, the new grant, the American Recovery, the American Rescue Plan, we've not received the application for that one yet. And that'll okay. go for three years, FY 22, 23, and 24. Do you know the time frame for that one? I know we haven't gotten it, but when? what's the turnaround time frame? Well, we haven't received the application yet, so we don't know any details. We're not sure what is eligible. We've heard from MSDE that it probably similar to CARES too, but we don't know any details yet because we have not literally even received the application. We're expecting it'll be due sometime this summer, but none of that is known yet. Thank you. And then I have one different question. Um, given that the county executive um, indicates that these positions, I'm looking at the 122.3 enrollment based teachers could be added back using anticipated federal grants. I have been hearing from schools that they're receiving their staffing and many schools have um, been notified to surplus teachers. Will the county executive's message do anything to the surplusing of teachers that's currently who are currently being notified of that now? Well, um, I would say this. Uh, I'll, I'll circle back with Jeff Bond, uh, who kind of manages that process. But we are requesting, you'll see um, in CARES 2, the 122 positions, but I believe the allocations are based on the one year projection of students in the school. He's not um, reducing them because of this. So uh, the schools, and it's in the budget book, uh, right. the January one year projection. So most of the loss from this year is made up but school by school, it varies. So if the projection, I'm just making it up, if the school's projected to lose now, maybe they're down 100 kids this year, and the projection had them down 40 kids, that might equate to the loss of a teacher. I'm completely making up a scenario without knowing the details. So I'm guessing that's probably what they're experiencing, but it's because of their students it's not because you know what I, I i should speak to mr bond first but i i'm guessing that's probably what's driving it is that they have less kids in the building which is going to equate to less teachers but we always go back and look at that in the fall and if there is a mismatch um uh, mr bond will usually put that position back because uh, he has some positions that he holds back just for that because he knows the projections are never going to be right exactly. And of course, in a year for, like this, we're going to see more volatility than maybe we ever have in history, both in terms of how many kids we lost this year, how many kids will come back next year, um, and just school by school, you know, at a very micro level, there's going to be a lot of volatility. But um, we can check with Mr. Bond just to check that or if you or if you know yeah. and could send the schools that you're concerned about we you know we could give an explanation to that principal mr well, bond could give an explanation. can i just throw in that sometimes it's also a surplus if a programming in the school because it comes from within out. Sure. so it could be a shift in the programming of the school and particularly this year there may be some shifts just in terms of things that the principal perceives he or she might have to do in the school. Uh, I think we need to add that it, it may be the school losing a FTE, but the system exactly. is not losing a FTE. So, no, I, I, I understand that. Thank yeah. you. All right. right. Thank you, Mr. Tantliff. Thank you, Ms. Pastier. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. Thank you, Ms. Matt. Yes, ma Does that conclude your questions, Ms. Matt? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. McMillian, and then I'll call on Mr. Kuhn. Yes, please. Mr. Tantliff, could you move your screen? I want to thoroughly understand 
what the county executive added. Did he just, was it the principal, the clerical, and the athletic directors? Was there anything else? Um, most of his ads uh, were proposed for the federal grant. So um, let's see. So if we go for, just look for the pluses here. Um, this is just benefit changes. He did add the principal and the clerical for the new Northeast school and the million in startup costs, the athletic directors, as you mentioned. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So, okay. Now, as far as that, how could his staff be that in tune to know that we needed funded funding for a principal and a clerical for the Northeast? And we didn't include that in the budget ourselves. Uh, we, we told him we needed it because it happened very late in the superintendent's proposed budget process and it was driven by the county. It was around Christmas time. So uh, once that all got settled, we then went back to the county and said, hey, we now need the million dollars in startup, the principal and the admin. And they, they agreed with us and agreed to fund it. And because that million in startup costs is one time, we put in a request for non-recurring costs to MSDE. And for something like that, they'll almost always approve it. So it won't go into maintenance of effort the following year. And that's so that the county can fund things like that and not be on the hook to refund it, to fund it again, even though those expenses won't reoccur. Okay, and I know it might be shallow, but I wanna thoroughly understand the athletic director position. Were there conversations there or was that something that he just was in tune with that he added or was it a back and forth? How did that uh, transpire? Uh, what I can tell you what I know, I can't, uh, and that's all I can say is this was a previous proposal. Um, By us. Yes, yes, in prior years, not this right. year. And uh, so our fiscal, the analyst who works for the county, who's our main interaction on the budget, said the CE wanted to fund the athletic director conversion, how much would it cost? So we gave them the costs, gave them some feedback, uh, but this was really his decision and whoever he was having the conversations with. Okay, great, thank you very much. Sure. And I'll just mention on that too, the way the CE set it up is those athletic directors will keep their current um, school teaching load and just go to 12 months because um, if the position changed something in the future, you know, are they even TABCO employees anymore? Do they become case employees? These are all uh, questions that could not be addressed or answered this year. So what's funded for this year is the straight up conversion to 12 months with them all retaining their class loads. And, and some of the principals have worked it out, you know, approximately I don't know, 10 or 12 out of 24 are non-teaching, but the principals work that out within their staffing. Okay. Uh, so it's so it's interesting. I've been told that if they did take away the teaching responsibilities, then the amount of money increased drastically because then those schools would have to be, you know, I don't know whether reimbursed is the right word for it, but they would have to somehow get the funding for those teachers. Well, uh, Well, think of it this way. An athletic director, I think, normally teaches kind of a half load. Yeah, teach, normally two classes if they teach. So if you think about it in a very simple sense, if we got rid of 24 teachers teaching a half load, we need to add 12 teachers, teachers. back in the system to cover that load. So, you know, call it almost a million dollars. If that ends up being the scenario in the future, it'd be very expensive. Okay, great. Thank you for explaining that. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Did you have any other questions? Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. I, I did have a follow-up to Mr. McMillian's question, Mr. Tantliff. You you said that the um, expenditures for the, the principal for the Northeast Elementary and the clerical were one-time expenditures? No, they're not. I'm sorry. Just, they're, they're not one-time. They're part of this. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, please. That, um, that's the principal and the clerical will be ongoing, so that would go into maintenance of effort. The one million fifty thousand, which is just startup costs for for uh, things that aren't covered 
by capital costs that the school needs to open up, that is the one time piece of it. The clericals for half a year, the principals for a full year, and they would be ongoing. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tantliff, um, my questions really are focused around the maintenance of effort and what happens in the out years when the CARES Act money is no longer available. And, you know, we're, we're at a higher maintenance of effort at that point, correct? Well, what we're always, always careful of, um, and we can talk about this a little on the next agenda item, um, but what we're always careful of is to not fund things <clears throat> that would fall off a cliff when the grant goes away. You want to really be thoughtful about funding items that are only for the life of the grant, or if they're going to continue, that you have a way to fund them after. So the simplest ex um, example would be if you added new FTEs, new positions, once the grant goes away, you would have to find a way to fund those positions, or you would have to absorb those positions into vacancies and reduce your headcount overall. So that's always something that, that I think is the superintendent's number one priority when he's considering a grant application. Staff too, of course. Okay, so just so I'm clear, all this money that's coming in via CARES um, and whatever, whatever we're calling it, ESSER or whatever the, the different names are, all of that money, in essence, it's kind of one-time money, right? Or it's it, some of it's over multiple years, but it's one-time money. It's not an operational ongoing type of a grant, right? That we'll see forever. Um, That's correct. It, but so so that money somehow doesn't increase our MOE. No, that's federal funds. Maintenance of effort is only based on local funding that comes directly from the county. So state funding's excluded and any federal funding's excluded from that. And any capital money from the county would be excluded for that from that. Okay, great. I, I really appreciate you clearing that up because I was concerned about the cliff, like you said. Um, when we talk about the CEP funding, right? And it seems as if there's a tremendous amount of money coming from the CARES Act to, to, to support the food, right? The out years, we're expecting to rebalance as people start paying again. Uh, so we're not, we're not concerned about supporting CEP funding going forward, or do you expect some kind of reduction or what, what are you seeing in the out years? Well, the board directed that we expand the program by 87 schools, so, as long as that program stays in place, the expenditures, I mean, they might be more, they might be less, but generally speaking, those would still exist. We, we've already, the program is already in place, so those costs are already existing. They just didn't manifest themselves this year. So to answer your question, this would, if we put them in the CARES 2, which we have, <clears throat> that would cover the costs in FY22 and 3. And then in FY24, we have to find a way to fund it. So it gets us two years of, of runway to decide to, you know, maybe we decide we don't need the program expanded or expanded less at that point, or the you know, it's a critical need and the county agrees to fund it in year three. Those are all possibilities, but this will at least uh, alleviate the issue in FY22 and FY23. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. And Mr. Tantliff, I had one follow-up regarding CEP. Um, given that our reimbursement is not covering our costs, are we looking at our suppliers, at our overhead? Are we, um, is there an effort to bring our costs in line with the reimbursement, given that the board um, moved to expand CEP? so that we're not in such a precarious situation? Well, I, I guess what I'd honestly say, Ms. Mack, is when the 
for the board expanded the program without consideration of funding that expansion. It's a very classic unfunded mandate. I think food service, I'm speaking a little out of turn here. Um, Ms. Levenstein could, could speak more artic articulated better, but I think they control their costs very well and they're always looking for low costs, just like everywhere else at BCPS. Um, I don't think I don't, the funding doesn't supply 100% of the cost. That's just the math. Um, but she or someone or Charles, her boss, would have to give you more details on initiatives they may be looking at. But I, I don't think they have the ability for that program to be self-funded. And I don't think the program is intended to be or has the ability to completely be self-funded. And part of it is also based on how many free and reduced kids are at those schools. So remember those schools, you know, they're not 100% free and reduced. So the lower your percentage and, and your percent of course drops. So the minimum for CEP, and I haven't looked at it, but I think it's 40%, I might be wrong. It's 40%. Well, that means 60% of the kids aren't getting free and reduced meals, right? So if they in Baltimore City, it's a much, much higher percentage of the population because they went to CEP and I'm speaking a little out of turn, but their reimbursement rate is going to come closer to covering their costs, if that uh, makes sense. Can I uh, jump we, in, Ms. Han? Yes, Ms. Pester, I was just going to say this may be um, a good um, topic for a future meeting agenda. Sure. Uh -huh. I'm watching the clock too, but Ms. Pester, please. Uh, yeah, just um, very quickly. Yeah, that percentage is so, but for this year and, and that number that we have, it was based on the fact that the number of people who qualified for SNAP um, were thrown in to, um, to broaden that percentage. So that is, as time goes within the next couple of years, hopefully, um, that's gonna shift because some of those people who were thrown in and who were eligible this year won't be. Um, but we will find um, the way because our systems around the state are embracing it and around the country uh, because the wind side of it is worth out trying to do that. Also back to Mr. Kuhn's, Kuhn's um, question and the answer about falling off of that cliff um, because we do a lot, of, have a lot of conversations about magnet programs, um, but we need to remember, that just as Mr. Tantliff was saying, um, is that for everyone that we put in, especially those that have imposed in them specialized staffing, I'll use IB as an example, but the staffing in the school doesn't change or hasn't changed, they haven't changed. And so that means when you have a program that requires certain teachers, you have to have them, you have to staff them, or you're supposed to staff them, and then that's going to impact what the staffing looks like. And that when we start talking about teaching bodies, then that might mean that we're losing a staff person somewhere else for a critical mass course. So we should also be thinking about this. This is one thing we might want to put on the future agenda, just processing those specialized programs that require specialized staffing. Um, how long are we able to sustain that and what's the impact on the staffing in the rest of the school? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pester. And I've, I've noted that on my, my list as we um, talk about possible future agenda um, topics. Okay. That brings us to our next agenda item, which is CARES Act budget and expenditures. Um, Mr. Tantliff, would you please provide the report of the sure. budget and expenditures? Thank um, you. Uh, what I have up on the screen now, everyone received a copy of this uh, several weeks ago in uh, your weekly update on the board's weekly update, and it's also in the attachments for today's meeting. So here's basically right here, CARES 1, 
which basically started with the pandemic outbreak and will finish the expenditures by the end of this fiscal year. You can see by far the biggest dollar amount here is for food service. And um, I think all of you are aware food service is the one piece of the budget where there was no revenue coming in when the people weren't working or when the kids weren't going to school. So whereas for most of our staff, the state and county revenue was static. And so we were still able to pay all our employees since the enterprise fund or the food and nutrition fund is self-sufficient. There was some revenue coming in, but it wasn't nearly, you know, for the brown bags they were giving out, but it wasn't nearly what their staffing costs were and we didn't lay anyone off. So by the uh, end of this year, we'll have funded them roughly 14 to 15 million dollars. And that is just to replace um, their cash outflows, that their expenses that were greater than revenue. And again, it's your full staff when you're only feeding a small percent of the population you would normally feed. Um, you can see the next item there is equitable hey, services. Wait, just real yeah. quick. In, sure, a, in, Brian. Addition, in addition to the salaries, it was also the uh, supplies uh, that they had to purchase as well, as well. produce, dairy, bread, sure. fruit, I mean, et cetera. So um, they used what they initially had stored on premise that probably only carried them hypothetically a month. And then for the remainder of the time, we've still had to purchase uh, to make sure we were able to meet the need. So I just wanted to add, because that's, you guys just saw a couple contracts that came across for, for bread, what that cost is. That's a little over a million a year uh, produce. Um, so just wanted to, to add that piece. Uh, go you. ahead with Thank you. Um, the next item is equitable service for non-public schools. Those are private schools within Baltimore County. They were eligible for some funding and it flowed through us. That did not continue, fortunately, for the CARES to in future. Um, we don't believe in the future grants. They're receiving money directly because, uh, quite frankly, it was, it was complicated to manage that. Um, we're sort of acting as a conduit uh, and there was a process for them to purchase through us. Um, headsets, uh, staff and student headsets, self-explanatory device buybacks were, uh, you know, as we were trying to ramp up all those devices, those were devices that came off lease and were still in good condition. So we bought them for pennies on the dollar. Uh, student internet connectivity were hotspots. A lot of them went to Title I students. Uh, distribution devices and materials. That's literally all the postage for uh, when we first closed down last year when we were mailing devices and we were mailing CNI materials. Facilities reconfigurations are a modest amount of, of you know expenditures from facilities to put up um, some PPE. Uh, student health services PPE was almost a million dollars plus uh, contract cert. Uh, tracing, which were both in the medical office and the health services office. Um, so the first, and then you had asked about devices before, that was on the technology grant. That's where almost all of those expenditures lied. And I believe that, I didn't think, uh, George, is that 10 million roughly or Jim? So that's why that's that not shown 12, here. The, tech, the uh, CRF technology grant, was 12.6 okay. million. Um, that was from the US Treasury as well as the tutoring grant, 12.7 million, um, which are not technically ESSER or CARES grant, but they were part of the overall federal stimulus package. Yes, thank you. And so I wanted to mention that because Mr. Kuhn had asked about the devices earlier. Um, our expenditures, uh, you can see here, it's actually higher now. This is a dated chart, but um, with it by year end or within the several months we have to book everything, we'll have spent almost $27 million on this uh, grant. 
Um, and then let me just roll into CARES 2 or ESSER 2 here. And this is, we were just talking about. Uh, the, gr the final grant won't look exactly like this and we've fine tuned the dollar amounts and a couple of items I think are going to get pushed off as other expenditures go up as we finalize them. Uh, but I think it'll give you a feel uh, and answer to the questions you were asking about. So the 122 teachers for enrollment recovery, uh, that will be submitted. Um, and in terms of the cliff, we don't feel like this is a cliff because assuming we get all of our enrollment back, we were reducing this because it tied to the thousands of children that we lost. So we're projecting that they're going to, for the most part, come back next year. So that would self-fund the 122. Or stated in another way, if we'd never lost the kids, we wouldn't have had to propose to reduce the teaching staff. Um, the 15 minute extension uh, that uh, we are planning to put into the grant and the CE had mentioned that. The expense here is uh, several million higher than what you saw earlier and that's because grant funded employees cover their full pension cost um, and that's not required on the general fund so that pushes the costs up a bit. Um, the school administrators are also going to get funded for the extended day. Uh, the ventilation HVAC, this is something that may uh, end up dropping out of this grant, but that was allowed in CARES 2. It wasn't allowed in CARES 1. Anything that had to do with ventilation or air purification. You can see we have CEP expansion on there, which I think you all know. And then uh, the final item, which is being finalized by CNI. Um, is the middle school program, which already has kicked off, plus the summer school program. Uh, and the award total on this one, you can see significantly higher than the first one, but actually, um, yeah, still about double what the other grants totaled for, even if you include the two that Mr. Saris mentioned. So it's 96.7 million, and again, the American Rescue Plan, we've gotten our just total from MSDE with no totals, that'll be 217 million. And with that, if anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Tantleff. Um, Ms. Pester? You're muted, Cheryl. No questions at this time, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Ms. Joes? None. Okay, thank you. Ms. Mack? Ms. Mack? Sorry, sorry. Um, Mr. Tantliff, if I refer back to the PDF that we started with at the beginning of the meeting, it appears to me that what is unfunded in CARES 2 is the 35 positions for counselors, PPWs, social workers, et cetera. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So if uh, that um, get that would have to be addressed in the American Rescue Plan funding. Okay. And one of one of the watch outs with that, which we've discussed, um, is that you'd be funding those positions and the funding would work, run out in a couple of years. So we just need to be careful of um, how we add them and be sure that if we couldn't fund it in the third year, we'd be able or fourth year if it was the American Rescue Plan that we could absorb those types of positions into um, vacancies, you know, our normal turnover. Um, and the, the, um, I'll also mention the CE said PPWs, which were not part of our proposal. So his right. verbiage was counselors and PPWs amongst other positions. Okay, so again, you haven't even received the paperwork for the American Rescue Plan, so we don't even know enough about that to say whether this would be included. 
Is that correct? Um, I think we, we probably, if you just ask me, is it like, are those likely to be eligible expenses for the grant? Um, the answer is probably, you know, if the rules are similar to the prior um, awards, you know, does it, 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 what's the right makeup? Is it 35? What should those positions be? You know, that would be work that would need to be addressed, keeping in mind that the funding is for a fixed amount of time. And, and do you, you, you mentioned four years. Do you know that right now that it is four years? Um, it's three years. Oh, three so years. So CARES 2 is two years. We believe that the American Rescue Plan will cover FY22, 3, and 4. Okay. Thank I think you. FY24 needs to be confirmed, um, but they believe it will be covered. So we believe that will be a three-year grant, and we put one-third of the funding into the budget for next year. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Mr. McMillian, do you have uh, any questions? Yeah, one question, please. I'm dropping my computer. Is uh, I'm trying to understand that example that you used of falling off the cliff. So is, is that similar to the concept of fast forwarding? Where um, money is spent ahead of time? No, it's not at all. Like you're thinking okay. of capital projects, forward funding? Forward funding. Okay, so no. it's two different complete concepts. Okay. No, forward funding just means with capital projects that the county is funding their full share up front in anticipation and the can and the state share in anticipation of getting the money from the state in the future. This is not at all like that. Think about it like this. We have two years of funding on the grant. If we hire a person, they're paid for for the two years of the grant. The grant goes away. How do you pay for them in the third year? Gotcha. So the money and that's true of every grant we have. Now, with Title I and the pass-through IDA special ed grant, it's not a big concern because those are recurring grants. And generally, they the, lately they've been going up a little. But smaller grants that we get that only cover a few years, the grant managers are always, always, always very mindful of that. And they might have to hire, let's say, three teachers, but they know that it's a number that could be absorbed um, once the grant goes away. So. If it's a significant number of positions, say you were, you wouldn't want to hire 50 psychologists because your turnover is going to be much lower than that in a year unless you are confident of that funding source. So and thank so you very much for helping me understand that. that. Sorry. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Mr. Q. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Uh, Mr. Tantliff, um, I, I apologize. I know you, you touched on it briefly and you mentioned that there was another set of grants. I think they came from Treasury and they were, were they focused on technology that we received earlier? Yes, Mr. Saris was detailing uh, that it was about 12.6 million on technology and a similar amount on the tutoring grant. Okay. All right, so 12.6 on both. Uh, what was the exact amount, George? Yeah, 12.6 and 12.7. So total was about 25.5, which is comparable to the CARES 1, which was about 23.7. So, okay. and those were unusual in that they, we got them in July. They had to be fully spent by December uh, by design, and it was it was quite an effort to maximize the use Great of this use. dollars. Okay, great. Um, so for for the funds that we have outstanding in twenty two and twenty three, can I just ask a basic question? The amounts, like the breakdown, 52 million, almost 53 million one year and 44 million the next year. How how did they come up with that or who decided the breakdown? Um, the grantor does not give a breakdown by year. They tell you the time period that the money can be spent. 
So if we thought the best way to spend the money was to put it all in FY22, we would have been free to do that. Or you could have been free to do it in the second year, which wouldn't make any sense. I'm just making an example. So um, we, we costed out the initiatives and that's how the money fell. And really the only difference between the two years, if you look at it, it's a pretty close split other than we, we put in some inflation on the 15 minutes for steps and colas. The only real difference between year one and two is the enrollment recovery teachers, because um, as I mentioned, we're confident that we'll be able to fund them just through maintenance of effort and regular state revenue because the kids will come back. And, uh, and just as a reminder, the children, our enrollment count this year um, produces our funding both from the county and state the following year. So in other words, September 30th, 2020 drives our funding for the following year. Um, and also, uh, just as a reminder, or in, in case you're not aware, uh, the along with the blueprint legislation, the legislature had um, for maintenance of effort. In all, so the state basically flat funded us to year ago. They didn't, our funding went up. Well, it actually ended up just dropping by a couple dollars, but let's call it flat. But it would have dropped by $20 million if just based on our enrollment. So every LEA was like that. They were flat funded by the state, but in order for us to get that hold harmless grant, the county had to uh, provide a maintenance of effort that was at least the same amount of money, not a maintenance of effort, but they had to produce at least as much money as they did a year ago. So they had to basically produce flat funding also, or else we would have lost um, more that it's actually closer to $30 million in the hold harmless. Okay, and um, we did talk about the cliff, and, and we're looking at the extended day 15 minutes being being paid for out of this grant application for two years. Are, are we concerned about that going forward? Yes, that is a definite concern. Um, and the way it's positioned in the grant and the requirement of the grant is this initiative is to specifically address learning loss caused by the pandemic. This is being funded by a grant to do exactly that, which might not be the same reasons that the 15 minute concept came up several when it first came up a few years ago. So this is funded for two years and two years only. So in year three, the um, school system working with the county will need to decide should that continue? And if it does continue, how will we fund it? Can the county fund it that year? You know, they're aware of that. They're aware that this is a two year cliff and um, the people receiving the funding probably, they may develop an expectation that the funding will be there in the third year. But right now, everyone needs to clearly understand this is being funded on a grant for a specific purpose to restore learning loss that occurred due to remote learning and COVID. But I'm sure it'll be a question for year three. So we get through two years at least with this grant. Yeah, I would suggest that was never the intent uh, of the board's request. Um, I understand how we're kind of doing some backflips to try and shoehorn it in. Uh, but again, uh, we were trying to address the length of the school day. So I see underneath it that the school administrators are getting um, money also for the extended day and the question i have for you about that is um aren't they are they exempt employees i'm curious as to how they're getting extra funding because they're well, not sure well hourly. teachers are exempt employees too so the teachers you know i'll just they could have agreed to work 15 more minutes without changing their compensation but in this case um, for the teachers to work 15 minutes, their, their requirement has been to basically get a proportional amount more money by the amount of time their day is extended. Um, the school administrators do not, though, have a defined day. You know, teachers define day, the school day six and a half, then the teachers have an extra 30 minutes, so they have a seven hour work day. That's not defined by the administrator, 
the, by the principals and APs in the case contract, but their um, discussions with um, with labor relations and the superintendent were that you know if the teachers and kids are there 15 minutes, their their day is going to most likely be extended. That was the discussion that took place. And so um, we believe that would be an eligible expense in the grant. So it's included here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Ms. Knack? Yes, I have a very quick question. Mr. Tantliff, if I'm doing the math correctly, um, before we apply for the American Rescue monies, we're look we are looking at having received 100 and $49 million through CARES 1, CARES 2, the technology and tutoring, would that be about correct? Yes. I don't so, have the exact dollar, but that sounds That right. sounds about right. And then another 217 million. So from, and this is all federal money, correct? All federal money. So we're looking at ha receiving an additional $366 million that we never received in the past unprecedented yes okay i just wanted to make sure my math was correct thank you very much yes it's it's as enormous as it sounds well i know and that's why i wanted to check my numbers because i'm sitting here moving de um, decimals and i'm i'm thinking that can't be right but it is 365 million 938 so i just wanted to check thank you thank you thank you miss mack and that brings us to our next agenda item thank you mr tantlett Thank you. Our next agenda item is the ransomware financial impact. And for that, I invite Mr. George Saris. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, the information that we have um, is, I believe, what was shared with the board on uh, January, April 16th, and I will, let's see if I can try sharing my screen to uh, find uh, this spreadsheet. Um, so I don't know if I've been successful or not. Um, it worked. Okay, great. I'm Thanks. not as good as uh, everybody else with this, but uh, you can see that uh, we're currently at $7.7 .7 million in total costs. Uh, the largest update here. Large. Would you mind making your screen a little larger? Absolutely. Let's see if I can pull that off here. Thank you. So is that too much or enough? Perfect, thank <laughs> I, you. I feel like my optometrist. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> we have added, uh, if you go, I don't know if we can see lines here, but the one major chain update that I've made here is uh, to line 18, uh, which is the time automated timekeeping system, which, one, which is one of the major systems that we lost. Uh, the, the system that we've been using for about 11 years is called Kronos. Um, and we are hopeful, we, we were, we're looking at demonstrations from three different vendors. Uh, ideally, we'd like to get something in place so that uh, with a six month implementation period, we might have this done by the new year. Um, and uh, this is also a an addition, uh, this 800,000, uh, we did not add this to the bat. So um, I am plant, since we're entitled to recover administrative some administrative costs in in the CARES grant. Um, I added this $800,000 figure um, 
there. Uh, it's uh, the loss of that system has been huge and uh, necessitates a lot of manual data entry. A lot of employees are unhappy. You know, they were unhappy initially when we made the transition, but everybody has acclimated and there are a lot of questions now about is my overtime correct? Um, and so this is one of the key projects we have in our recovery plan post ransomware. And I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have about any of these items. Thank you. And Mr. Sears, we can see through row 20. Were there any other items? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. That actually matches with what I can see. So I'll know exactly how far to move this here. So the the bottom uh, half the, of those items are actually items that we've already paid for, for the most part, out of our existing operating budget. So uh, they do not represent uh, any um, extraordinary costs. Were there any projects that we had to defer or delay? Um, were these reallocations from other planned expenditures? Yeah. Yes. OK. Any large ones that you can think of off the top of your head or perhaps if Mr. Corns is here, he could. Well, I think the two largest items, the device monitoring and tracking for 606,000 and the VOIP security 268,000, those are. Um, expenses that were built in, but these are new and improved uh, services in those areas. And um, I don't know specifically, uh, I, I think uh, if Mr. Corns can offer any uh, insight, that would be appreciated, um, but uh, they didn't represent any um, significant loss of of other services. OK, that that was all um, I was asking about. My concern was that if we are deferring any other critical projects um, as a result of the ransomware attack, then the board would want to know about that just to to make sure. That yes. allocations have been granted. OK. Thank you. I'll turn it over to committee members. I'll call on each for questions, um, starting with Ms. Pester. No questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pester. Ms. Joes. Ms. Joes, did you have any questions for Mr. Zares? Ms. Mack? No, I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Mr. George, I'm a complete novice at this, and I'm just trying to understand. I've read somewhere that the 12 month pay option for 10 month employees was going to be delayed because of the ransomware. And then somebody else just said to me, well, if they're starting over, why can't they, if they're rebuilding the payroll, why can't they build that in now? rather than wait. Does that make any sense or is it the fact that you're putting so much effort into recovery, you just don't have time to build that in? Thank you. Yes, it's the latter of those two that we've just had to uh, direct so many resource to, resources to the recovery and uh, we discussed that with the superintendent this morning and, and he has asked us to put together a presentation to explain how uh, the uh, the 12 month pay option will be affected. Um, so that will be coming to the board. 
Ms. Hen, can I jump on Mr. McMillian's question or may I jump on his question? Sure, go ahead, Ms. Fister. Okay, um, uh, thank you, Mr. McMillian, for asking that question. That's in my cross, so I should have asked that question. Um, and thank you, Mr. Saris, for the update um, in, in terms of the superintendent's um, request of you um, to do that. When you um, bring that forth, because that was a part of uh, my request um, for a report on what the years look like in terms of compressing uh, the salary scale. Um, so when you do that report, will you be able to give us a sense, one, of the thinking that's going into, I heard your answer to Mr. McMillian, but the thinking that's going into um, that 12 month pay for those, te for those um, teachers who want it um, as you're putting um, the system back together. Does that make sense that it's not just being put back together, but as it's being put back together, since you had to move the 12 month to the side, um, what the thinking is or what you're thinking is as you're doing it so that we have an understanding of what we're talking about in terms of time when that might happen and how it might happen. Yes, a new timetable is being developed and will be part of that presentation. Um, and just getting back to the fact that uh, that we've lost our our automated timekeeping system uh, b basically requires that all that our <laughs> payroll staff are doing now is manually entering hours for every yeah. employee and it's just um, we, we're really not even at you know at a place where we were six months ago and the additional efforts to to develop and roll out the 12 month option. Uh, there are just not enough human resources at this point, but we will uh, map that out for you. And uh, at, based on our projections of when we're of these other recovery priorities uh, will be included. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Hen, for letting me jump in. Of course, thanks, Ms. Pasture. And thank you to Mr. McMillian for for raising that question. Um, I think the the board is is concerned. We've had lengthy discussion in the past, and and we want to ensure that we're providing staff with all the support needed to to make you all whole and make our staff whole. So thank you, Mr. Saris, for that. Certainly. Um, next, I see that um, Ms. Mack, if it's okay by you, I'm going to go to Mr. Kuhn. I believe he has questions, and then I'll return to you. I actually just wanted to address Ms. Pasteur if I could. Sure, go ahead, Ms. Matt. Um, Ms. Pasteur, your question to Mr. Saris, was it specifically about the 12 month pay or also about the, the compression of pay scales? No, I um, last, if you recall, on Tuesday night, last night, <laughs> last, <laughs> yeah. okay, last night um, when we went around about agenda items. I just said mine was directed to the superintendent as my April tickler that I had asked several months ago that on in the end of June that we get a report on um, the 12 month and the compression. Okay, but I two forgot different things. 12, I just wanted to yeah, make sure you No, were they were different. And I just forgot to say 12 months last night. Mr. McMillian said it. OK, that's all. I just wanted to clarify that it was two separate things. Yes, okay, those thank you. Things. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Mr. Kuhn, did you have any questions? I do. I do thanks. Thank um, Mr. Saris, uh, my first question is. What what is our insurance limit? Is it two million or five million? Because I I've, yeah. I've, I've heard both. And it's it is both which makes it confusing, but it's two million in direct costs, which are the type of costs we have here. And then there's three million dollars in liability coverage. So if uh, a third party were to uh, have been damaged by the, the losses in our system, 
For instance, if we were unable to pay people or unable to pay vendors, uh, they those type claims would come under that liability portion of the insurance coverage. OK, thank you. I appreciate that. That's that's good to know. It's like property and liability. Uh, so the the Windows security software, the Dell Carbon Black, that's a one year license for one point four million dollars. Is this is this an item that we're going to con continue to purchase annually or because? Yeah, um, so initially the insurance company provided this for the first 30 days um, and then they strongly recommended we continue it, but it is uh, it's applicable to Windows based devices. So as you know, um, uh, many of our servers will not uh, will not be reinstalled and under our current um, student and staff device plan the number of windows based devices will shrink as we uh, make the fully uh, full move to Chromebooks and so this fee will uh, persist um, but at a at a, at a decreased okay. level each year and, and I don't know exactly what at what point we'll reach a minimum uh, but um, I Mr. Sarah, so let's let Mr. Corn just jump in just to give a little more yeah clarity around that and some of the other initiatives uh, that we're trying to take just so Mr. Kuhn has a, a, a clear uh, big picture. Mr. Corns. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. So, um, Mr. Kuhn, as uh, Mr. Saris uh, spoke to, uh, when the uh, ransomware initially uh, hit, we were uh, utilizing Windows based devices for multiple uh, levels, including our middle schools. So, as we've begun to swap those middle school devices out with Chromebooks, that will decrease that demand. Um, another important note about the carbon black installation that we have is we also bought it with 24 7 uh, knock. Um, support. So it is being monitored um, outside of BCPS by um, the vendor itself. So in case something um, is triggered on its detections, um, that we have that service. So uh, the amount of carbon black that we will need, the number of uh, licenses per is going to decrease as we um, move into next school year, uh, first with the middle school and then uh, following through with the uh, with uh, uh, high school the year after. Um, in addition, some of these um, services that Carbon Black provides, um, as Mr. Saris uh, mentioned, they were used by our initial um, forensics team and we were strongly suggested both by them as well as uh, the state uh, cybersecurity uh, um, agency to maintain this uh, very high level of protection. So um, once we start putting in place uh, some other mitigation strategies like uh, our um, our firewall upgrade, which is going to have a much more robust presence, um, the, the carbon bl black fee will uh, continue to uh, decrease. On an upshot, um, we've uh, identified fundings, uh, funding sources within DOIT that will not impact any of our implementations, but be able to cover these costs without requiring the board to uh, bring more money to bear. Thank you, Mr. Corns. I hope that helps, Mr. Kuhn. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Could you scroll down a little bit on this list? I, I can only see the number 20. Right. I, I want to look at the Presidio cost. So it says device monitoring and tracking. What? Is this when you when you're talking about uh, device monitoring and tracking, are you talking about uh, laptops and Chromebook tracking or is this equipment tracking across the whole enterprise? Uh, Mr. Kuhn, uh, Presidio is the vendor that we procured uh, the uh, the the aforementioned carbon black from as well as um, 
I'm sorry, Mr. Saris, uh, on my view, it's much smaller. Uh, that's part of our line item in that in that point. Presidio was the vendor by which we procured. Right. I see. I see three. I see two line items under the smaller recovery cost estimates, and there's mm -hmm. a line item for device monitoring and tracking for six hundred six thousand dollars. And my and my question is, what is that for? Laptops and Chromebooks, or is it for something else? No, that's that's our laptop and Chromebook um, deployment there. All right, uh, and it's our Windows device uh, deployment there. We use a, a separate uh, piece of software, not within this ransomware uh, list for our Chromebooks. Okay, and when it says monitoring and tracking, is this is this like a it's like a, a blocker or something? Uh, it's it, it's monitoring and uh, the uh, the titling of this is a little misleading. We're not actually tracking the devices. It is monitoring and tracking um, the uh, services and the activities on the device uh, in the background, not what the user may be doing, but like processes that the computer may be running or malicious software that may be uh, looking to be installed. So those that's the monitoring service. Uh, that they're they're keeping an eye on that stuff as well as the active blocking that the the software itself does. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. So, Mr. Corns, just to uh, to clarify, we're not tracking the location of our devices. Is that what you're saying? Uh, only if they're lost, stolen, or requested by the police, Ms. Hen. We've utilized um, some of our software at the request of uh, the Baltimore County Police Department to do things like locate missing children and things of that nature. But in general, uh, de minimis tracking is not occurring in BCPS. OK, thank you very much. And I see we have a couple of other questions. Um, I believe Ms. Pester was first or did you? And then Ms. Mack. No, I, uh, mine was, I think, just, I threw one in just to pick. Yeah, no, my, I don't have a question either. My bad. Those were old chat messages. I apologize. Um, thank you, Mr. Corns. Thank you, Mr. Saris. You're this welcome. Incredibly helpful. Um, the next item on today's agenda is information items. Mrs. Pasteur and I work to draft budget committee mm -hmm. goals for the committee's consideration at our next meeting. And the draft goals document may be found on board docs under information items for today's meeting. Um, the next meeting of the budget committee will be on Wednesday, May 19th at 530. Committee members, is there any further business? Hearing none, and because there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank, so, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I love this meeting. Thank you.